Drake cruising with 330, and the objects are still in the sky, although the one to the side looks like it's losing a little bit of altitude. We're turning around and heading back toward uh, the base. The object, to the, side, the object to the south is still beaming down lights to the ground. Zero so four hundred hours, one object still hovering over Woodbridge Base at about five to ten degrees off the horizon, still moving erratic and similar lights and beaming down as earlier. On the night of 27th of December 1980, an object described as being metallic in appearance and triangular in shape was seen by two USAF police patrolmen outside the back gate of RAF Woodbridge. They described the size of the object as approximately 2 to 3 metres across its base and approximately 2 metres high. The object illuminated the entire forest with white light. The next day, three depressions were found where the object was sighted in the frozen ground, 1.5 inches deep and 7 inches in diameter within the forest. The following night, the area was checked for radiation. Beta and gamma readings of 0.01 millirotogens, which is a normal background radiation reading were 0.05 to 0.07 found around the depressions and on the side of a nearby tree facing the triangular depressions. Obviously the object when leaving that area had left a trace. Later that night a red sun-like light was seen through the trees. It appeared to throw off glowing particles which broke then into five separate white objects and disappeared. Immediately after this, three star-like objects were noticed in the sky, two objects to the north and one to the south, all of which were 10 degrees off the horizon. They appeared elliptical through an 8 to 12 power lens. They then turned to full circles. The objects in the north remained for an hour. The objects in the south remained for two to three hours and beamed down a stream of light from time to time. Numerous individuals, including the undersigned, witnessed the activities. This letter was by Charles I. Holt, Lieutenant Colonel, USAF, who was a Deputy Base Commander. What makes this very different from other sightings is the fact that one of the three men on patrol managed to actually touch the craft. What happened next is mind-blowing. 26-year-old Sergeant James Penniston was part of the three-man USAF security police team called to investigate the landed craft of unknown origin in Rendlesham Forest. The men with Sergeant Penniston were A1C John Burroughs and A1C Ed Pat Cabinsag. Only Penniston and Burroughs went into the woods to investigate the landed craft. Cabin Sag stayed with the truck to act as a radio relay for the men. Cabin Sag watched as his two team members headed out on foot. As Penniston and Burroughs approached the unusual light, they noticed abnormal sensations on their hair, skin and clothing. It seemed as though the air was electrically charged. Also, a time distortion occurred. According to the men, time seemed as it was slowing down and it was difficult to move. Another odd characteristic was everything was void of sound. Now visible, the craft was sitting silently at the bottom of a berm on the pine forest floor. Penniston cautiously approached the non-aerodynamic triangular black grossy craft. It was like nothing he had ever seen or witnessed before. There were strange type pictorial markings on the side of the craft. 
when Sergeant Peniston put his hands on the edge symbols, which felt like sandpaper compared to the rest of the smooth, moulded surface. Everything became a brilliant bright white. He could neither see or hear. He was alone in a bright, brilliant white light. This occurred for an undetermined amount of time. Then his sight returned. He was standing next to the craft, facing the pictorial glyphs. The craft started to turn a vivid bright white colour. So bright, in fact, Sergeant Peniston thought it was going to explode. He took a defensive position nearby as the craft was engulfed in the light. The craft then lifted off approximately four feet from the ground, manoeuvred between the trees, ascended to the tree top level and disappeared in the blink of an eye. The following day, back in his room, Jim was seeing ones and zeros in his mind's eye. Now this is where it gets very interesting indeed. Jim Peniston had a notebook which in that he wrote down the pictorial glyphs on the side of the craft that he saw and also the ones and zeros that the craft uploaded or downloaded into his mind. When he wrote them down, he said, they seemed to disappear from his mind. Later, he didn't tell anybody about this in case they thought he was mad or he was losing the plot. But later on, in 2010, he approached someone and asked them to have a look at this since it's binary code. And now, some facts. Before anybody says, well, he wrote that in his diary and his diary was made not long ago. How do we know? It's a provable fact that the diary that he wrote the binary code in, the ones and zeros, was actually written after the event in 1980. In the 1980s, we didn't know that much about binary at all. It's only since now it's a well-known thing. Later in 2010, Jim approached a binary code expert and researcher, Joe Luciano, to ask him if he could decode and interpret the message. And this is what Joe said. Exploration of Humanity 6668100 Underneath this, there is a northing and westing coordinate Underneath that, it says, continuous for planetary advance. Fourth coordinate, continue out, UQS, CB, PR, before. Underneath this, there are six other coordinates made up of northing and westings and northing and eastings. Underneath these, eyes of your eyes, origin, a second amount of coordinates, northing and westings. Underneath that, it says origin year 8100. So the first thing we need to ask is, are these coordinates just random? Or are they of specific places? If so, where? It so happens that they are. The very first and very last coordinates are the same and they are of an island known as High Brazil. This controversial small island originally set off the east of Ireland, just above another small island known as Demar, off what is now known as the Porcupine Bank. High Brazil is in Celtic lore and also known as the Irish Atlantis. It's featured on very old maps, namely the Mercator, and the famous Piri Reis map after the Turkish Admiral Piri Reis, who stated he compiled his map from older source maps, his map being famous as it shows Antarctica before it was covered on ice, indicating others had sailed the globe prior to the ending of our last ice age. It's controversial as it no longer exists, this is obviously due to various seismic activities across the ocean floor. The latest paper, which is downloadable on the internet, 
is by a professor, Benjamin Theobordo. He clearly demonstrates this. Not to mention that the two island outlines are clearly seen on Google Earth. The next coordinates are the famous monuments of Caracol, situated in the jungles of Belize. The next coordinates are the monuments of Sedona in Arizona, USA. Next coordinates are the Great Pyramid of Giza, Egypt. These photos I put on here to try and emphasize the sheer size of the structures which you do not normally get on the internet looking at normal photos. The next coordinates are what's known as the Nazcar lines in Peru. Again these photos are taken from a satellite view so you can appreciate how large and how long these lines actually are if they're seen from space. The next coordinates are of a place called Tai Shan Chi in China. The last coordinates are of the Potara, which is a massive marble standing door in Naxos in Greece, the Temple of Apollo. It's funny that when Rendlesham is normally discussed, the people, or shall I say the skeptics, never discuss the binary code. Obviously, if it was just a bunch of random ones and zeros that Jim Pennison wrote down, it would be easy to say it's just a load of nonsense. Or it was a mass hallucination on everyone's part. Or the other theory put forward is that some of the guys from the SAS were playing tricks on the Americans. This is complete nonsense and propaganda from the newspapers who ran that story. This is not something the guys at Hereford would do. They are always too busy training on ops or spending quality family time. The actual account of the events do not fit this theory at all. The other skeptics theory is that what they saw was light from the Orford Ness Lighthouse which is over five miles away. Again this theory falls apart with the actual events properly looked into. Since things like this do not happen regularly, they're not a regular occurrence, in my personal opinion, with what we know at the moment, with regards to quantum physics, other dimensions that surround us, e.g. dark matter, empty space, and the origin year 8100, I believe that we are dealing with something like time travel. A craft that was came and sent back, reason completely unknown. But this is something that I believe, I think we are absolutely scratching the surface. Hence, there's a, not, a lot more to life than what we previously understand. So be open and don't be closed-minded. Thanks for watching. Cheers.